welcome to Introducing a Method for Developing and Strengthening Intonation Through Improvisation. My name is Virginia Shingleton, and I'm a volunteer with the National Flute Association. The NFA was founded in 1972 as a common ground for flutists to exchange ideas and inspiration. In the years since, it has grown to become one of the world's largest flute organizations with members from all 50 states and countries across the globe. We invite all of you to become NFA members if you haven't already and take advantage of our year-round benefits, including a subscription to the Flutist Quarterly, borrowing privileges from our sheet music library, discounted instrument insurance, and more. Visit nfaonline.org to learn more and join today. We'd also like to acknowledge that today's online event is made possible with support from our members, our donors, and the Illinois Arts Council Agency. Thank you, and now I'll hand it over to Vic Wheeler. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I see we've got a few faces in here that are familiar, some some new friends as well. If you can hear me okay, can you give me a thumbs up? All right, great. So I'm tuning in from Austin, Texas today. It's a 69 and cloudy according to my computer. Um, I would love would it you if you drop it? in the chat where you're tuning in from, your uh, Louder, city and please. state. Let me, uh, let me turn up my volume just a little bit. Is this a little bit better for you? A little bit more. All okay. right. Yeah, I'm just gonna step a little closer to the microphone. Thank you. Yeah. So I see we've got some uh, Oregoners here, <laughs> Texan here personally. Um, so if you haven't already gotten your flute out, I do invite you to get it out now while I tell you a little bit about who I am and how I came to be here chatting with y'all. So I used to feel so hopeless at improvising that I'd freeze up and miss out on opportunities to play with amazing musicians and then later regret it. But after I rediscovered improvising as a means to a deeper connection with my higher power and my inner self and my community, I gained a, a comfort zone with improvising that has enabled me to collaborate and participate with my friends and family and with musicians who are both amateurs and professionals and, and so doing create these long lasting memories. How did I do that though? The first step was what became a unique combination of long tones and drones or drone tones that I've started to think of as tone chi. Anybody here done some Tai Chi? It's very slow, right? But it trains our muscles like the muscles in our embouchure. And it helped me to overcome the anxiety of improvising while also strengthening my tone, my vibrato, and my intonation. I've also simplified everything that I've learned about piano and music theory into a method that has made it easy for me as a flutist to know which notes to play. After people kept on asking me where do I teach, I decided to create an online group and community for classically trained flute players who are improving their improvising and where I can share my special trainings and resources. One of my students said that in the two weeks after she watched my free class, she made more progress in learning to improvise than she had made in 50 plus years in her music and music education. So I made this special class for NFA Online so that more classically trained flute players like you can experience the fruits of improvising and expressiveness and Get a taste also for the resources that I've been gathering in the Flutarians group. So I invite you to remove your distractions, maybe turn off your phone, maybe grab something to take notes on and to get your flute out if you haven't already. There will be a couple of opportunities for us to play together and maybe for one or two of you to join me in a little duet. If you stay all the way to the end, I would love to share with you one of the music apps that has totally changed um, how I practice these drones and I use it almost every single day. And I'll also be happy to share my personal folder of backing tracks with more than 300 backing tracks, including two that um, we'll be using a little bit later. So 
by a with a, a show of hands like this, I would love to hear um, if you had to rank from a zero to a five your own personal confidence level in improvising. How would you rate it? Like, uh, I see a couple of twos, a couple of ones. We've got a seven maybe off the charts. We've got a resident expert. So my goal in this session is to help you move up just a little bit in that confidence level. And I promise that if you listen to what I'm sharing and participate in the next 45 minutes, take it home and practice it a little bit. It will help you boost that confidence for improvising and I bet it will improve your intonation too. Not just for playing solo, but also for playing in ensembles. So, I would like to invite you to join me in a little one minute warm up for what I call the um, the Doppler effect sound game. Do you know that experience when an ambulance is approaching you and it sounds like the pitch is wobbling higher and higher and then when it passes you, it sounds like it's wobbling lower and lower? Well, I invite you to take to find your mute button, come off mute, maybe turn on the original sound for musicians. And I want to hear the sound together of like a, a swarm of ambulances coming towards us. Now this is not an exercise to sound pretty but this is a sound to explore. And it could be a potentially new sound that you could bring to your audiences. So I'll grab my flute. And when we've had um, a minute to do it, I'll just set my flute down and give us kind of a, a hands closing gesture, okay? So, oh, also I was going to turn on this backing track. Does anyone hear a little bit of an A sound, a drone sound in their ear? Yes, so this is like A442. It might be a little bit sharp for you guys. This is my tempura backing track. And I'll demo what I mean. And then please join me for this little one minute warm up. audience, what is one problem that you have noticed with the just playing a single A440 note before your performance? Anyone noticed a, a situation or a problem that comes up when we just have one tuning note? I invite you to come off. Some of the other notes are out of tune. Seems like some of the other notes are out of tune. Like, what What if the, the C sharp is, is wonky and we just start on the A? What if maybe we're playing, about to play a, a song in B flat and we just warmed up on an A only a half step away? Our ear is now tuned to a, a different tone center than the B flat. Anybody else notice some little problems with... Uh, just taking one very brief moment to play a A440 together. So one of the things that I've noticed is the changes in weather and barometric pressure and temperature in the room, right? Sometimes it's if we pick up our instrument and we haven't had five, ten minutes to properly warm up all the metal, or same thing for the maybe oboist or clarinetist sitting next to us, then 
we may be at a slightly different pitch in five minutes than we are after five seconds of playing. Has anyone experienced those changes in playing in a cold or a hot room? Yeah. Another one that I've experienced is that the difference between just intonation, like on a piano, where the intervals are all the same exact number of hertz apart, the distance apart, and, and, oh, I was saying just intonation as opposed to equal temperament. I switch swapped up my words there, but what I mean is that when we're playing with stringed instruments or other woodwind instruments, that interval, for example, for a major third might be a, a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller than if we're just looking at a tuner. So, any other experiences y'all have had that you care to share with uh, just uh, taking one improv note or one... Uh, <laughs> I, I, for, please forgive me if I mix up the words improvisation and intonation in this uh, class. I've, they both start with the I and the end with the N, so... Um, any other comments at the moment? I notice sometimes I'll be in tune with a particular note um, in a, one octave and the same note in another octave is not in tune at all. That's a great point. Yeah. So I've noticed that when it comes to improvising and when it comes to intonation and tuning, that there's two very distinct ways of tuning and they're so distinct as the left brain and the right brain it's like the visual aspect where we're looking at a tuner right in front of us and there's the aural the hearing aspect which is more like a feeling sort of right-brained experience and i see the looking at the tuner right in front of you as more of a logical left brain experience and it's nearly impossible to switch over into the left brain when you're mid flow in the middle of a song and so if we can develop our ability to hear with our ears and feel with our bodies when we're in tune and in harmony and in sync with our accompanists our other ensemble members then we can let go a little bit more of that logical mind and step more into the state of flow when we're performing where we can access those more emotive, more expressive musical statements. So I'll share with you three exercises that can improve your, improv your intonation. And the first one that I'll be sharing is something that I intend to be used solo and the next two are ones that you can use in groups or in duets. Briefly, I want to share with you how I have learned to kind of color code which notes are in the scale and use that for choosing what note I want to play next. So... This is my, one of my favorite apps. Just moved it up from an A to a C. And I've, let's see, make sure you guys can see this. I'm gonna move it over just a little bit. Um, I can do that. Bear with me as I'm uh, still testing some of these technologies. Okay, so on the very left side of this image, I have a color spectrum. And at the very bottom, there's the the hot and warm colors, red and orange and yellow. And up at the top, we've got the cooler colors like a blue and dark blue and even a vibrant purple or a violet. And has anyone ever played that game with their, their friends or family? Like you hide something and they're looking for it. And when they're getting closer to it, you say, oh, you're getting warmer, you're getting so hot. Yeah, and then when they're getting further away from the, the home object that they're looking for. It's getting cold, they're getting colder, so cold. So I want you to think of that experience now when looking at these colors on the keyboard. When we play along with a pianist, we want to play on our flute the same notes that the piano is playing in the left hand or playing the chords, or if it's not a piano, maybe it's a, a 
guitar or a cello. And the three notes that go best along with the, the tonic or the first note, well, I guess it's the two notes, right? Because the tonic would be redundant. We've got the C, it's warm, home, like close to a fire. And then the fifth, the fifth is, I'm just gonna adjust this mic. I have a request for a little bit more volume. See if I can get it closer to me. Sound a little bit better for you guys. The fifth, the G that I have marked here is an orange color because it's so similar to that first note in sound that it's almost the same. It's like sitting close to a, a warm fire. And the E, the third, I think E sounds like a field of yellow sunflowers. It also has that warm, close to home feeling that when we play all three together, it's, it's a pleasant feeling, right? And when we play something that's a little further away, like the A, or the D, it feels a little bit more yearning, right? Like, we want to go back or go somewhere. And I made this B a dark blue, but really I meant for it to be like a vibrant violet. Like, it's really leading either back to that C to a red, or back down into something a little more sad, like an A. So, if you're a beginner here, and you're just brand new to the idea of improvising, I would recommend just start with one interval. Like... Stepping up to the D and then going back. Turn on this backing track in your room with the audio on real loud. Play your flute and bend up into that pitch and bend back down into the pitch and feel. Feel the tension in your, your ears buzzing between your ears when you're up here trying to go back down. Or you can try it just a half step down into the D. So, I have I have here a little demo of what I imagine we can do with our vibrato. I used to think that the vibrato started in the middle and went up above the pitch, but I learned that usually just goes right up like that and we can experiment with the drone with making these pitch bends really big and really wide we can also experiment with bringing it way above the pitch center and then back so the basic prescription here for exploring these intervals all the way up a C scale is playing the pitch as high as you can like this. And then bringing the pitch lower and seeing if you can bend it all the way down into another half step or a half step below. I like to pretend that I'm playing a, a clarinet or a saxophone when I do that. But the reason that this is so helpful to us is because it gives us a reference point for that pitch that we're trying to, to hit. In my experience, when there's just one A440 oboe note and I just play one, one note, I feel kind of like I'm throwing a dart at a, a target and I just have one chance to get it in the center. But when we practice bending the note down and bending it back up and feeling when we've reached that in syncness, we've reached the in tuneness, then it's like we can throw a, 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 a wash, like a, we can throw a, a below 
the center target point and we can hone right in on it. This also has some advantages for us outside of just making a little improvisation in our, our practice rooms. This is something that will make our embouchure more flexible so that when you're sitting next to your, your bandmates and you hear, oh, maybe they're a little bit flat on this note or, oh, they're a little bit sharp on this note, I need to adjust, then already you're getting used to moving your flute or moving your lips or moving your jaw or moving your tongue to make those little micro adjustments to meet, meet your ensemble members. So what are a few of the advantages of taking an improvisation like this and taking it out of the practice room and putting it on stage? I want you to imagine for a moment that you're in the shoes of your biggest fan. Like maybe your biggest fan is your mom or your spouse or one of your kids. I don't know about you, but my mom thinks it's a miracle that I can get a f sound out of the flute at all. And I remind you of that now because most of us in our flute player mindsets, we want to be so perfect. We want to play all the right notes. We want to play them perfectly fast, perfectly in tune, but it's a miracle that we're making a, a sound come out at all. And, and when we bring something like this on stage, even if it's just one improv where we're doing this, Someone in your world may have never heard a pitch bin before. I'm curious, do we have anyone watching who's had pitch bins written directly into a piece of music they've been playing? Maybe some more modern music? Yeah, so practicing those will make that embouchure flexible. It will train your, your flute gym muscles, your gymnastics muscles, to be prepared to adjust at the last second, so to speak. And another thing, oh, just a brief story I want to share with you that changed my life. A decade ago, I saw a TED Talk where Daniel Kish, a blind man, came on stage and explained that he's been using echolocation to navigate his environment. Now, as a flute player, that changed me because I started listening to the sounds that came back from the rooms that I was playing in. Right now, I'm playing in my my small home studio, it's barely eight by 10 foot. The sounds come back a lot faster than if I were playing in a 800 by 1,000 foot sanctuary or hall. And when we take a moment, 30 seconds or even a minute or three minutes to play a little improvisation, it gives us the chance to hear what are the acoustics like in this environment before we go headlong into a concerto, or whatever the next piece of music is. So I invite you to explore playing the lower octave, playing the higher octave, and even if you're just brand new to improvisation, remember the, the one-note samba. Remember that playing just a, a, a single note a few times will be a, will give you more information about your intonation than playing just a single note. In fact, if, if you just stopped watching now and you had one key takeaway from this, that would be my, my thing that I hope you would take. Play more than one note. I, I've personally experienced at least once when I went to a concert and I saw someone get up on stage and they played a beautiful note and I thought it was the beginning of the concert. And that's a good question. When does the concert begin? I have heard people clap after the tuning note as well. So take that chance to introduce yourself to your audience. Don't, you don't have to be boring with a single note. People came here not to judge us, but to hear our performance. So get a little bit of information about how does the, how does the hall sound when it's full of more people. There is also a chance to establish a connection with 
your duet partner or your bandmates before you just jump right in as well. I know a lot of us experience stage fright when we get up and it's time to start a piece and we, we just kind of get the tuning note out of the way. But if we take a few more moments to take a big breath with our bandmates, we can make that connection with our eyes and with our hearts so that we're a little bit more prepared for what lies ahead. So when it comes to practicing with the drones and the Tai Chi, I recommend practicing each interval slowly, separately, long tones, maybe one or two notes in each breath, and begin deciding for yourself what colors what colors do you experience? And also, just so you know, those intervals, they transfer up by, by, each, by each key. The intervals always sound the same related to each other. So... I mentioned before that if you're a beginner, you can just make a one note improv or you can make a two note improv or a three note improv. Here's what a two note improv might sound like. I'm going to choose the first and the fifth. Or a three note improv. you're more comfortable you can play all the notes in the scale for a little improv another advantage to playing a, a few notes that sound beautiful to your audience and for you are serving the purpose of warming up your embouchure, your body, and your ears is what if your next piece starts on an uncomfortable note like a high A? I don't know about you, but I'd rather not go into a high A on cold lips. And so when we take a moment to hear and uh, literally warm up our, our lips and embouchure, we can have a little bit more confidence that we're going to hit that beginning note where we expect it to be. And we'll have a little bit more information about, is the person way over there going to be able to hear this? What might it sound like to them? So, an exercise that I do sometimes with my students that you can do with a duet partner, either a pianist or a flutist or whatever kind of instrument they have is basically passing off like a call and response arpeggios. Let's say we're about to play a piece in the key of A major and our pianist just gives us a little and they hold on to that low A and we can go back Maybe they even change up the rhythm a little bit. And we are connecting with our duet partner, hearing what they're playing and saying, I'm with you. Would anyone be open to trying a little a major arpeggio call and response with me. Can I get a hand up? I've got Michelle. And, and maybe Erin if she grabs her, her flute. Michelle, you want to come off of mute? So the way we'll do this is I'll First, I'll play the long A, and you can play whatever A major arpeggio you want. And then when you finish your breath, you play the long A, and I'll play whatever arpeggio I want. 
we'll do this just with one long note for each of us. And I invite those of you who are listening on mute to, I challenge you to play and listen at the same time. Um, and for brevity, but you, I, I say we'll play this just two long notes each, but you could play this for as long as you want to or need to with your duet partner. Are you ready, Michelle? So yes. I'll play along A. Thanks for participating with me, Michelle. What I was thinking there is that you play together at the same time so that you're tuning in to the, that tonic dominant note, but you have the opportunity to check the tuning on your C sharp, to check the tuning on the, the higher A as well. So, another variation on this that gives us the chance to start warming up our ears to a key change as well, is just a variation on one, the one chord, and then adding the five chord. Now, when I'm teaching improvisation, I only add one chord change at a time. So today we're just gonna talk about that one chord change, the one to the five, but you can find that in almost any piece of music. So one of the things that you can bring in here when you're improvising a little, oh, prelude with your partner is you can include the, an element of rhythm. Like if you're trying to play, okay. Apologize for interrupting myself there. Do I, do, can you raise your hand if you hear a little bit of a piano sound in your headphones right now? Right, so this is a, one of my backing tracks that's just three times playing the one major chord and one time playing the five major chord. So if we as flute players want to play the same notes that are in the chord of the piano, we can only play one at a time, so we can play it as an arpeggio. And when I hear that switch to the G, to the five chord, I know to switch my arpeggio notes to notes that are in the G chord, kind of like this. Here comes the C. you can continue that idea there. I want to be brief for y'all, but the idea is that one of you can be the rhythm master. They can think in their mind, oh, our next piece of music is at 80 beats or 100 beats per minute. And they can establish the, the rhythm with just those two notes or the two tones, a couple of notes. Now, I would love to try that one with you guys, but as you know, sometimes there's a bit of a lag here on uh, Zoom. So there's a variation that you can do on the one and the five that doesn't incorporate the setting the rhythm. And I'm wondering if Aaron might be willing to participate with me. Basically, it's just one person starts with a big breath on the one, the C here, Play out your long breath, then play the fifth note, the G. Play out your long breath, and then one more C. Would you be willing to play those three notes with me, Aaron? Okay, so you could come off mute. And same thing here. If you want to play all the notes in the scale, you can. But if you just want to play a C, the one first note, or a first and the fifth, or the first and the third, you have the option to choose there. Play within your comfort zone in this moment because you're just warming up like you're stepping into the flute gym. 
Are you ready, Aaron? Mm -hmm. I'll wait for your C. You know, I love to improvise. I would be happy to just be playing music with you guys all day long, but I'll give you the chance to find out um, when and where I'll be doing those in the Fluterian group later. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry for showing you the top of my head there. I was just <laughs> bending down to, to check on my notes. I do have this exact backing track available for y'all as well as the one that I was using earlier. And I've been exploring some online um, apps that reduce the latency so that we as flutarians or flute players can replicate that in-person jamming together experience. Now, I'll take a little bit of time maybe after question and answer to discuss with y'all ways that we could incorporate this in a bigger um, ensemble like a band or an orchestra or maybe a chamber ensemble but just so you know I'll be opening a discussion on that topic in the Flutarians group after this so we can carry on the conversation there. So Thanks for sticking around so far to learn about what my experiences have been with improving improvisation and improving intonation at the same time. I did mention that I would love to share with you my favorite app for changing the pitch. This is called the Music Speed Changer app. And um, I think Virginia has the, uh, the link that she can drop it in the chat for us. Basically, you can use it on your computer, on your Apple phone, or on your Android phone, and you can drop any song that you've downloaded in there, like this Tampura track, and change the pitch up, change the pitch down. Same thing with the rhythm as well, though this is a drone, so we're not really going to notice the rhythm. I was also mentioning how you can access the Flutarians group and the backing tracks. So if you're not on Facebook, you can get these backing tracks on my site. That's a go.flutarian.online slash backing tracks. Virginia, if you could drop that um, link, that'd be great. It'll, it'll take you here where you can download the backing tracks here. This is my drones and single chords. This is the Tampura that I was mentioning before and the C major. So also if you, you are on Facebook, this is really the place to be for all the resources that I've been gathering on this subject. You can get the backing tracks right here, as well as some of the replays from talks that I've done in the, the not too distant past. Um, I do love making collaborations as well and duets. So if this piques your interest and you'd be open to testing out some of these new technologies for making a little improv duet online, you can get in touch with me on Facebook or on my Flutarians website. And just so you know, to serve those who are, are ready for it at the highest level, I'm launching mid-April a private group of flute players, classically trained flute players who are improving their improvising together but there's only three spots remaining. So if that's something that you know that you're ready to move forward on now, leave behind those anxieties about improvising in front of other people, please do not hesitate to uh, reach out to me after this call. It's a first come first serve sort of basis. So I wanna thank you all so much for the uh, attention that you've given me so far. And I wanna open up it up now for a little bit of a conversation for any sort of questions you might have for me. Did this spark any um, questions or any personal experiences that you think others in the NFA community might benefit from hearing?
I do. Hi, Erin. I can hear you. What what you got? Well, I know there's a difference between playing a melody by ear and playing the chords and everything on improvising. How would you suggest incorporating the knowledge from what you're teaching, improvising, to being able to play a melody by ear? I love that question because I I made a note to hopefully circle back to that sort of topic. I was talking earlier about how each, I like to teach, when I'm teaching music theory, I like to start with the piano, the piano keys, because if you start in C major, you're playing only on the white keys. And so my recommendation for improving that ability to play a melody by ear is Mm -hmm. to start in C major figure it out in one key and then turn on that music speed changer. Because if you have memorized already all of your major scales and your chromatic Mm -hmm. scale, your Mm -hmm. ear is going to start knowing, oh gosh, that wasn't the right note. How can I use the chromatic scale to get up to that tune that I know so well? Like some of my favorites that I think a lot of people know are Amazing Grace and Oh Danny Boy. And if you can learn it in one key, you're memorizing the intervals. You're learning okay. how to audiate it or hear it in your mind's ear before you hear it coming out of your flute. And okay. when you hear that, oh, what came out of my flute is not the same as I heard, the not, not the same as I'm imagining that melody to sound like that I know so well, You Mm -hmm. always have in your back pocket that chromatic scale. You can go up until you've reached it or you can go down until you've reached it. In fact, that's one of my little tips, secret tips for attaining a jazzy sound. Now, some of us are strictly classical players, but I will tell you that knowing my chromatic scale fluently has saved my butt so many times in improvising (laughs) when I hit what I, I guess at the wrong note. I guess at a note that is, is not in the scale or it's, it's not what in the melody that I meant to play. But if your fingers are fast, it, it turns into a blur of notes and it sounds <laughs> much like the glissandos that jazzy saxophone and clarinet players use. Mm-hmm. So our, another piece of, another just piece of my experience that I want to share with you to that you can hold on to for a little bit of confidence is that the body knows. Haven't you ever just sat and played your scales with without your 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 mouthpiece? You're just you might have even assigned this to some of your your students where it's say go home and watch SpongeBob on the TV and, and play your chromatic scales or or something like that where we're getting the muscle memory. So you may very well surprise yourself like I have when I'm th- I have all these things going on when I'm improvising. I'm listening to all these things that could be distracting me from a, a cell phone ringing in the audience to my 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 clarinet player squeaking on his his <laughs> you know it's things things happen and we can take that moment to um just kind of hone in. Yeah. It's a great question, Erin. Anything else that uh, is popping up in your mind? Nancy. Hi, thank you for this. Um, So, all right. I have a student who uh, wanted to audition for the jazz band in school. And uh, he got in. We worked very, very hard, and it was a huge learning process for me because I didn't know anything about it. But we learned um, how the we learned all his uh, scales that he had learned the you know the the blue scales. We learned the uh, got him in improvising over a backing track, and somehow it was a miracle that this kid, as a freshman, got into the jazz band. So big victory. It still is very mysterious to me, though, because you were talking about um, 
uh, improvising with the triad on the one scale and the five, you know, um, tonic and dominant. And that's not what we did at all. We only improvised on the notes that were within his scale. And I, I started the way you did with just um, you know, one note, two notes, and then we we actually chose two very basic rhythms that he was going to um, improvise around using the notes that he was using. So I said, just stick to this one rhythm, do that a couple times with different notes. Then you're going to come go to a different rhythm. And we had specific rhythms. You know, we had like sentences with the rhythm. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to pull all this together and make some kind of sense about the whole thing, because as I said, it's still a mystery to me. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? I think I do. And, and I'm appreciating it because I forgot to use the phrase painting with sound earlier. I was, I was talking about how I experienced these, these notes that are further away from the triad as kind of distant and maybe a little sad. And so when we're making an improvisation, if we're, if we want to stay safe, we can stay close to home. We can stay warm, but music is boring if it's the same all the time. Right. So, and expresses the same all the time. So when we're playing up and down the scale, we're using these notes like the D and the A and the B, those blue tones to paint a, a a more vibrant palette of colors, uh, sound colors while we're playing. But I, I, I wanted to share also with you this image of the, this, this actually, this tool is called, a, I think it's Chrome, Chrome Experiments Shared Piano. And you can play it on your keyboard. This is my, my, uh, my computer keyboard playing that C, E, and the G right now. So when we're playing on flute, we can play these all right. We can play all the way up. But when we're hovering here on the B and the A, we know that it either wants to go back down home to the G or go back up to the C. Can't quite see it on the screen. But I was talking about the triad for when you change, when you change chords. Now where it feels like home has kind of shifted. Oh, I forgot to grab my, my drawing of the harmonic journey. I had a picture of my home and mom's house. Like the first chord and the fifth chord. When we're at home, oh, this is what we play. We try and stay home. But when we, we're going to mom's house, we want to hover around the same notes that are in consonance with this chord that our rhythm players are playing. Now, you don't, strictly speaking, have to have the, the chart in front of you and know exactly when you're going to change from the first chord to the fifth chord to the fourth chord to the whatever chord. You can do that by ear, but knowing it and having a chart in front of you or having memorized, oh, it's going to be four bars of the first chord and four bars of the fifth chord allows you to land with confidence on that the B or the D, which would normally be a little dissonant with the with the C chord. I'm not sure if that begins to answer your question, but man, we, we, we put ourselves in these situations so frequently with music where we try and play it fast. We've got all this new information coming into our minds and we're trying to make the right decision on the fly. So this is where I start thinking about slowing it down. If you can get a backing track or make a backing track, and load it up into that music speed changer and take the speed down real slow, you can experiment with landing on the third of the chord or landing on the fifth of the chord where it's, it's just more, it, it has that, that satisfying feeling as opposed to that distant going somewhere feeling. When, when I'm improvising and I feel and hear a note that it's, it, it, I experience the dissonance. I'm, I'm painting ahead in the future, almost like a, um, like a video game coming towards me. I, I see the next uh, chord coming towards me and I think, oh, where can I resolve this? 
like Guitar Hero, that's the one I was thinking of, or Rock Band, or there's a few music games that it, the, the music is just coming towards you on the, on the screen. And when we're playing, improvising, we can sometimes hear or know that the, ne the chord change is coming. And where can I place, place the note um, that's within the, the arpeggio or within the, the chord that the rhythm track is playing? How can I place it at the same moment that our, the rest of the band is playing? Is that making some sense, Nancy? Any any further uh, clarification on that? Yeah, I, I that makes that definitely makes sense. I guess I'm trying to figure out how to bridge the relationship between what you're explaining to us and the and the jazz scale. Mm. That's not really. I don't like know. A, like a blues scale. Yeah, blues scale. Yeah. Yeah. So. I actually don't teach blues scales because I teach the chromatic scale, using the chromatic scale. And to me, when you play a, oops, I meant to start on that C. When you play a C major scale, any of these other black notes are color. And yeah. like the E passing flat. Passing tones. <laughs> that's They're the effect you said? Passing tones, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, Gosh, I mentioned earlier that I, I made an effort to simplify everything that I learned from taking piano lessons and from taking music theory lessons and break it down into something that's simple enough we can think about it on the fly. And so I know that the notes that are in the blues scale that are outside of the C major scale are just color or passing tones and I invite my students to experiment with those but know that you can always use the chromatic scale to move up or down to something that sounds more harmonious to our ears. I could take maybe uh, one or two more questions before we're up at the end of the hour. Any other thoughts or questions to share? No thoughts or questions to share? Okay. I'm thinking of a... Oh, I see Nancy coming off me. <laughs> well, um, would you like to turn on a backing track and play something for us? I would be happy to. <laughs> I, I should... Uh, I was thinking, uh, gosh, I've been doing so much talking and so little playing. Um, I'll share that other story that just came to mind because I think it might be beneficial to some of you and maybe to some of the people watching the replay. And uh, then I'll, I'll pull, play a little bit of a, a Cosmic Butterfly song. I've been recording with this band here in Austin, Texas, and our second album is almost ready. So living here in Austin, Texas, which is nicknamed the live music capital of the world, I have found myself improvising with a wide variety of instruments and skill levels. And occasionally I'll find myself in the situation where I'm playing flute along with a solo vocalist. Now, I don't know if you know this, but I know that with the voice, since there's no keys or like there are on a piano or frets like there are on a, a, a guitar or keys like a, a flute, that their voice tends to drop and pitch as they sing along because it's oh it's 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 a little bit exhausting in our vocal muscles to to sing things that are high right so if i'm playing along with a a singer well i'll just say it i've had this experience i start playing along with someone there in the key of a and then they're singing along and next thing i know it we're in something more like between a flat and G sharp and I think sometimes this happens with double read and read players as well they may not realize that mid song they're getting tired and they're letting the pitch drop so if we're always in the visual tuner 
Okay, you can, it looks like I dropped out for a little while there. If we're always in the visual tuner and trying to be exactly on the green spot, then we may end up in a position where, to our logical mind, we're in tune because the tuner says so. But to the ears of our audience, something's not quite right. So, in an event where I'm playing along with someone whose pitch is dropping dramatically, I might even be prepared to change keys, but I am also prepared to maybe sacrifice my tone a little bit because we all know when you turn that flute in and you cover more of the, the hole that the sound might get a little bit wimpier is the way I think of it. So um, pre being prepared to use our ears like that in my experience has enabled me to be able to be confident in supporting a wider variety of musicians because most people aren't pros, right? Not professionals. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna pull up, um, let's see if I can find it here. Um, one of the there it is. Rush of Love is this backing. It's actually a, a fully recorded song. So much for joining me those who are tuning in now from your homes on your Sundays and those of you who are tuning in later on the replay I'm gonna head on to a, a matinee I've been invited to a premiere this afternoon and uh, continue on with my Sunday so thank you so much Virginia and uh, the National Flute Association for hosting and uh, once again if you'd like to follow up with me just check out my Flutarians site or the Flutarians group on Facebook Thank you. You're so welcome. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. I'll see you later. Okay. And no, thank, just you. Out. Um, thank you again to Vic Wheeler and thank you everyone who attended today's online event. A recording of this event will be published on the NFA YouTube channel later this week. If you'd like to see the schedule of our upcoming online events, visit nfaonline.org forward slash events. To learn more about other news and events, be sure to follow us on our social media at NFA Flute or visit our website at nfaonline.org. Thank you again.